I want to just take a moment to thank you. You know, uh, this is a very courageous leadership. It's a very bold leadership. Um, there's no subject too challenging or concept uh, too dangerous for them to bring it up for conversation. And um, they have been remarkable, even in taking on this adventure of a Holy Spirit journey. And I can't tell you how proud I am of them and of you as a community. It really is a remarkable story. Someone said, the great scribe called Anonymous, a prophetic people are those who see the future, who prepare for the future, and who become the future. A prophetic people are those who see the future, prepare for the future, and become the future. Don't you love toddlers? I love, I love what Meryl calls, my wife calls, little people. Uh, they're mesmerizing. They are captivating their world. If only I could get into their heads sometimes. But I love it when they're in the toddler, one, two, three-year-old ages, and they're running to get away from you. And in their minds, they're doing a, a, a 9.7 100 meter. They, they, are, they are flying, their little arms are pumping, their heads are going, the little booties wobbling, the diapers going flat out, and you in a few steps pick them up, and, you, and in their mind, you barely caught them. I mean, in their mind, they were so far ahead of you, it was by a stroke of genius that you captured them. Recently, Geico has been running an advert um, I don't know exactly, but every time I see it, I'm so happy, sad. And uh, it's about these two ladies that sing something about m move forward or move faster or something to that effect. And the advert ends with them sing walking behind an older guy who's pushing a lawnmower across the yard. Anyone know which one I'm talking about? And, and, and he's kind of going at his absolute best. He must be 80 in the shade. And he said, I'm going so fast, I'm going so fast. What a tragedy that we end life the way we began it, with diapers going so fast. A prophetic people is a people who anticipates that what God started, God will complete, that the way we began is the way we end. This is not a superfluous series. This is not a series that, ah, what should we do for 10 or 12 weeks? This is about a people who will see the future. What does the future of the church look like? This is a picture of a church that begins to prepare herself amalgamates, allows herself to be transformed, adjusted, put under the great heat of God, and then becomes the future. What I want to do with you tonight, really, is uh, speak as a father. I love being a dad. I, I, love, I love Meryl. We've been married 34 years. Uh, she's just come back from Australia where our eldest daughter and her husband and family live. They've planted a church in Perth. This accent is not Aussie. It is South African. But my Daughters decided to marry church planters, go figure. And Meryl just got back. She, she carries on her studies. She's doing a master's in marriage and family therapy, hence her not being here. But I love being a dad. It's one of the grandest gifts God ever gave me. I said to my girls, I will not walk them down the aisle unless I'm absolutely certain the man they marry is Mr. Right. I'm not apologetic, and I wasn't. And um, I enjoy that sense of journeying with him. And so as I was preparing for this time, knowing John Mark very kindly just said, come on in and just come and talk with us, I felt a little bit like my daughter on her wedding night, the night before she got married. Now, this is not true of my girls, but I want to use it illustratively. They had been molested. They draped. And now comes the night, and I know the two nights very clearly before I walked my girls down the aisle. But this is fictitious. And they come to me and say, Dad, what has happened to us has created a deep vulnerability and trauma. Will it be okay, Dad? Will that first night be okay, Dad? And the picture in my mind, as I've done many times and still do, even though my daughters are old, I put their faces in my hands like this and I come real close because this is a sacred moment between a father and a daughter. And I whisper because these are secrets between us. They're not for common knowledge. And I lean in close so that we can hear and feel each other. 
And I say, baby, it's going to be okay. In fact, better than okay. You can trust. You see, the story of the Holy Spirit, unfortunately, has been so butchered. Different cultures, subcultures, styles, mismanagement of prophetic moments, etc., 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 has led many a Christian honestly passionate for Jesus, but so nervous about opening their hearts up and saying, my hand is up. I've been listening to John Mark because parachuting into the series, I didn't want to hear what he's been teaching. And, and he told a story last Sunday illustratively of going to the water for the first time in the summer and you kind of put your toe in and then you put your foot in and then the knee and my son has just started surfing so he's dragging me into that culture. So I bought my 4.3 wetsuit. If you know what that means, it means really hot in the inside. And I step into that cold Californian water and I've got to be brave, and I've got to be strong, because how embarrassed my son would be if I was a wuss. But you see, it's that first moment, now, am I going to dive in, and to heck with my hair, the ladies say, not us guys, to heck with my makeup, the ladies say, well, and, and, and we, we <laughs> there is a sense, dear friends, and, and my privilege tonight is to exhort you, to encourage you, to enlarge you, to put your hands up and say, Oh God, there is, there must be more than this. There is. There is. There's more than cool, sexy worship. There's more than a gifted hipster preacher. There's much, <laughs> much more than this. And they've, with great courage and bravery, have asked the question, how thirsty are we? My son plays soccer and they had their JV game this week, and it was 70 degrees. I'm sorry I have to mention that in the story. I'm so sorry I landed here today, and it wasn't 70 degrees. And the sun was pounding down, and none of the rest of the team brought their water, and my boy carries a one-gallon water ice skater aid ready for action. Before the game started, there was hardly anything left in his gallon but a few pieces of ice. And I watched with intrigue as the team kindly almost fought about each piece of ice because they were desperately thirsty. This isn't a whiskey bar that goes around with an endless supply. There is this deep longing, oh God, I am so thirsty for more. Oh God, I want everything you have for me. And that's my privilege tonight to kind of parachute into the series and talk you around one, a tipping point text that I think makes sense of this all. Secondly, a case study where we'll look at someone from Scripture and unpack his story a little bit. And then lastly, I want to tell you some stories. Because you see, I do think this is what the Father has for us. So we pray, we look at the Scriptures. You ready to go? Okay. Father, we know you, and we love you, and we dearly want to walk out your purposes, your plans, and be submitted to your great sovereignty with ease and with courage. Jesus, we are enamored by you. We so dearly, as a bride to a groom, want to find the place of intimacy with you, knowing what your taste feels like, knowing what your embrace feels like. But Holy Spirit, we'd have to say, we don't really know you enough. Would you draw us in? Would you be kind tonight and draw us in just a little closer to your bosom? Let the lights, let the great aha moments happen where we say, now I understand where I did not understand before. And may our hands go up to say, there must be more than this, in your precious name. So grab your Bibles, please. We're going to the book of Acts. Those of you who are less acquainted with the Scriptures, it's about three quarters of the way in the Bible, on the right. And if you go to the four Jesus stories, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's just after that. It's a nice chunky book, so it's easy to find. Otherwise, just listen, as I will try to read it well. Acts chapter 1. In my former book, Theophilus, Acts chapter 1 and verse 1. 
In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach until, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. And after his suffering, he showed himself to these men and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, a great phrase, rich in content, transformative in life, and I know John Mark will be teaching on it. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And after he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in, while I love the angels, we neglect them, they're here tonight. No, it's not you, sir. You just would like to think you're an angel. Men of Galilee, why do you stand here looking in the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Luke, the doctor, the physician, the scientist, writes this account matched, as John Mark said last week, with Luke, his gospel story. He never met Jesus to the best of our knowledge, but rather he accrued the story by eyewitness accounts a little bit like a lawyer would do. He puts the story together with great detail, and the reason we suspect is Theophilus was Paul's legal counsel in Rome. We don't know for sure, but one of the commentators suggests that uh, Theophilus was the lawyer, and so detail was given to making Jesus the big story, Paul the subsidiary story, Paul fitting into the Jesus story so that Theophilus could defend him well before the judicial systems in Rome. Now, that's interesting, and it doesn't change our life, but what transpires here as a front-end, back-end sets the stage rather dramatically. Front-end. This is an account of all that Jesus did and taught. That's an interesting way to do it. Because in our Western world, what we do is we teach it, then we process it, we debate it, we dialogue, we critique it, we open it, we exegete it, we decipher it, and then if it passes all of our 12 steps of perusal, we decide whether we're going to do it or not. Jesus did it the other way around. He did it. Now I'm going to ad-lib a little bit here in terms of the text, but to illustrate it. It's 10 o'clock, the disciples are going to bed. And as they get themselves ready from a day of walking through the countryside, they're hot, they're sweaty, they're tired, there's been stories, there's been miracles, there's been signs, there's been wonders, there's been preaching, the hustle and bustle of the crowd, all overwhelming, and as they doze off, they notice Jesus slips out. Is this a moment they think that he does the five-star thing while we do the ground, that kind of gross, the ground surface thing? He comes back early morning, they're intrigued. Why is he looking so refreshed? Where has he been? What has he done? The next day is full of ministry and teaching and caring and loving and praying and healing. And that night, Jesus once again goes and the disciples decide, this is way too intriguing. Curiosity kills the cat. Let's follow them. This is a fable. This is not in the scriptures. They get to a quiet place, thinking this is somewhat intriguing. Is he going to meet someone? What's the mystery? But rather than meet someone, rather than go to a five-star hotel, he falls down on his knees as he begins to cry out to his heavenly Father. And one minute becomes five, and five minutes becomes ten, and ten minutes becomes an hour, and an hour becomes two hours, and eventually two hours creep their way through to the night as the early morning birds begin to sing, and the sun climbs out over the eastern horizon on that great Middle Eastern landscape. They are exhausted. they pinch each other awake and stumble their way back. And over breakfast they say this, Master, teach us to pray. Because what we saw there tonight, we do not know of. 
We have a mantra. We have a liturgy. We say the same things. We pray the same prayers. But what we saw you do tonight is profoundly different from what we are used to. And he says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who art in heaven. We read it as cold words of, of almost uh, liturgical relevance, but what did they hear? They heard in the darkness of the night, and I've been on the Mount of Olives looking out over Jerusalem and the Christmas of the Middle Eastern sky. They heard coming from his lips the worship as he sang his songs of affection to his heavenly Father. They said, now we understand. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, the very Son of God, who is God Himself, singing songs to His Father. Now we understand. You see, the front end of the text is all about what Jesus did and then what Jesus taught. The back end of this text, around which all of the New Testament hinges, we see the parousia, the return of Jesus. Now, I have a very vivid imagination, so when I preach, I know that creeps through. But of this text... There is incredible passion that wells up inside of me because like you, I'm eagerly in anticipation of the day that the curtains of heaven are ripped open. The great knuckles of heaven, the Father goes and pours open the clouds of heaven. I love living. I must tell you, I love my wife. I love my kids. I love the people we journey with. I love the city God has put me in. But there are times the pain of humanity screams too loudly at me, and I with the Spirit say, come, Lord Jesus. I want that moment to come. I don't know in heaven enough. I can't tell you I love Jesus enough to want that. At times, the only thing that drives me to cry out, Please come, Lord Jesus, is I cannot cope with people's pain anymore. But as that curtain opens like the great and ultimate drama of heaven, and the curtain starts rolling back, the first thing we see is the nose of a horse, the steed of the king. As he comes aloud, billowing smoke, billowing the, the, the energy of a war horse. And seated on him is the King of kings and the Lord of lords who is tattooed on his thigh and on his garment is this great royal crest. He's got a sword in his mouth. He means business. He's in a fighting mood. It is time to enact the justice and judgment of all time. Right and wrong will be clearly defined. And as he pushes his way through the curtain, coming behind him in peals and one wave upon one wave of the angelic host coming each to the four corners of the globe to gather to himself those who are called by his name. Ladies and gentlemen, that is a dramatic and a most exquisite moment and we will find fear and love matched together, colliding in our breasts. Please never lose sight, no matter how hard your life is. No matter how challenging your story may be, do not forget that one day there will be a great trumpet blast. And amidst all the, the great chaos of ultimate justice, your name will be echoed as the angels call your name and as Jesus, your groom, calls your name because he knows you by name. Now in between what Jesus did and taught and him returning is a micro matrix for life. It is a glorious moment that is described in this text, but the preamble is wait in Jerusalem. The word wait, we often take to mean quite passive. It's hang out, I'll pick you up at five, video games, texts, Instagram, and please only one Instagram a day. I'm, I'm, I'm learning, you, you want to be cool, so not many. Um, they got to hunt for you, they got, they, I'm learning, I'm learning all these things. No, no, this word wait is a lot more like the Israeli army. This is not a military statement, but a military metaphor. I'm intrigued by Israel. Israel is a small state with a small population surrounded by enemies who desire her destruction. Every man and woman is military trained unless they are conscientious objectors. Every man and woman have their fatigues, have their boots, their fatigues, their shirts, their jackets, their helmets, have their vests, have their backpacks, have their weapons. And for them, an Israeli wait means you are perpetually on standby awaiting the commission when it comes. And in times like these are, and again, no political statement, purely illustratively, there is a perpetual statement of readiness. And what, what um, 
Uh, Luke is recording is that state of readiness where every believer is on standby. We see what they do. They go up to the upper room and they pray. They cry out to God. They don't go and hang out in the taverns. But wait for what? And the, the tipping point text here, dear friends, is this. But you, that's not a singular you. It's you's. It's used. I, I, I'm a kind of a hybrid. I'm like an American-African. Or, or, yeah, because African-American confuses you. But I was born in South Africa, and I'm an American on passport. So when I go to Dubai now, in a couple of weeks to go minister, I'll be traveling as an American. So it's kind of an, a, a crazy American-African story. But can I say this now? Americans are intrigued by celebrities celebrities. There is this preoccupation with the few. So when we read this, we translate it all too easily that this must be about the few celebrities. So we, are, we have senior pastor, we have all these fancy titles given because we want to separate us and them. And when this text appears, it appears about these people. No, no, this text is the bad gramma, gr grammar of use. It's use. All of yous, every man and woman, every boy and girl, there is a use for you in here. Something is about to happen, something that is inclusive, something that commands all of our involvement. And yous shall receive power. Someone wants to FaceTime. I'm busy. I can't. My daughter, my second daughter, uh, courted a guy from London for a few years. As you can imagine, her living in L.A., him living in London was really, really difficult. And there was more than a few occasions she'd come and sit with me and say, Dad, it's so hard. It's so hard, Dad. It's like every FaceTime or every Skype conversation, we're trying to get a week into a moment. I, I want to I feel him, Dad. I, I want to hold him. I want to be held by him. And I'd have to hold and say, Miss D, baby... This is your normal. This isn't everyone else's normal. But, but this is your normal. So they recorded Hark the Herald Angels Sing. He did in a, in a studio in London. She did in a studio in L.A. An engineer in L.A. mixed it, and they played it on a British radio station. And I said, baby, that's your normal. See, what we are getting here is a momentary glimpse that we are about to enter a new normal. This is not everyone else's normal. The life we're being called to is not a Christianity that makes me a slightly better husband. I don't get that angry. Slightly more ethical at work. That I'm slightly nicer to my neighbors. That I drive my car a little better. What, is it my Volvo or Subaru? I'm not sure. It's, I drive that car just a little. No, that's not at all what Jesus died for. That is such a dis disastrous anticipation of the consequence of the cross. What happens here, this tipping point text, is used. Every man and woman will receive power because the new normal, the life he is calling us to be and to do, is not what everyone else does. He's engaging us in a new normal. Is that what you desire? The expectation and the anticipation that God is bringing eternity and our humanity together in a new story. When I came to faith, I was 18, 19, freshman here at college. And uh, I didn't know much. I, I didn't know much. But I was so eager. This was going to be my everything. I'm not going to stand on an escalator, a little bit of Jesus, a little bit of the world, Hang out with Jesus, a little bit of prayer, splash the offering with just a couple of dollars, and then my party friends and that world. This was not going to be my story. Intuitively, I knew that this would be an all-in. This would be a new normal. And I remember when I read that about the Holy Spirit, I was at a meeting. I said, Jesus, I don't know what that means. Holy Spirit, I don't know, is that like, ooh, ooh, is that scary? Or is it, you know, what is that all about? And we were at this meeting, and a guy says, who wants to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? I said, me. If someone had said, what do you want? I said, I don't know. 
I, I have no idea. Don't you love God's sense of humor? Now, I don't know if you'll understand the story, but this is what happened. My culture is very patriarchal. You'll see it slip through in my language. I'm trying to deal with my language, but it's very patriarchal. The man's the top of the pyramid. You are the dude. I really like it, but, but I've, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get kingdom here. And so God looks around. We're at this meeting. I'm saying, I want everything you got for me. I, I want everything. And I feel the soft hand on my shoulder that's about to pray for me. Now, forgive my flesh. The soft hand, I'm thinking, gorgeous blonde. <laughs> you did it, Lord. You've given me a gorgeous blonde. I turn around, and there is a Catholic nun in a habit. <laughs> and I'm saying, time out here. I don't know what a Protestant means, but I know it's not a Catholic, number one. Number two, at least give me a pretty girl if it's going to count for something. And I'm, I mean, I, and a oh, girl? I mean, give me a guy, you know, if it's going to be. Yeah. Don't you love God? So I thought God chuckled. I thought God looked around the room. He said, who can I have the most fun with, with Chris? Let's use a little bitty Catholic gal. And the game was on. Dear friends, this is a pivotal text. You cannot do this Christian story without allowing the yous, every one of us, the power that comes upon us, and it begins to create a new normal. We live a new life. Thirdly, in the story is that you shall be my witnesses, a great legal word used for a legal purpose. What is the witness? It's that person who describes what they've seen, what they felt, what they experienced, what they know. And so Luke is saying, quoting Jesus, that you will be the one who tells what Jesus has done to you and what Jesus has done through you. This is a great series. It brings together the raw nakedness of who I am and matches it with God's overwhelming power and His presence, as we heard so wonderfully from John Mark last week. And then fourthly, it says, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the world. I love that. I, I, I told you when I was here last that I, I was pretty much a redneck growing up. I'm an Afrikaner, which means nothing to you, but put in... Alabama, and maybe it'll mean something. I don't know. And so when I stand up here speaking in English, because Afrikaans is my first language, and I'm speaking to a room of incredibly gifted people, and I'm not that gifted, learned people, and I'm not that learned, I can testify and say what? What Jesus has done to me, what Jesus has done through me, that is the dunamis power of God. To do what? to testify in Jerusalem, the city I'm in, Judea, surrounding area, similar culture, Samaria, surrounding area, different culture, and to the uttermost parts of the world. When you embrace this, you are putting your hand up for the best ride imaginable as God pushes your boundaries and enlarges you to a story beyond what you could possibly imagine. Use. Shall receive power, a new normal to be my witnesses, what He has done to me and what He has done through me into Jerusalem, my city, and into the furthest expanses, the uttermost parts of the world. Case study quickly. When I was here last, are you doing fine? You with me? When, when, when I was here last time, I spoke a little bit about Peter. Let's trace his story quickly in the light of this. Here he is, just a real ordinary middle-class businessman. Wake up in the morning before the sun was up, would get down, have his boardroom on the boat, Get his guys together. We're heading out to sea. They would take their nets and off they go. He is living a cool life. He marries this gal. She's got a house up looking out over Galilee. Life is good. Life is ordinary. And then he meets Jesus. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Something is about to change. And so from this real ordinary business guy, he steps into what? The romantic idealist. He becomes captivated by Jesus. What happened to you when you, when you met Jesus? I was in. As I said, I was in. I was, um, I don't know how to translate kind of the sporting story, but I took all my kit and I gave it to my younger brother who was stoked because I was in. I was now the romantic idealist. I was now the new prophetic poet who was going to write the stories of this Jesus thing. 
And P- Peter steps into this. He gets home to his missus. What did you do? I just gave my boat away. Why did you give this stuff away? Well, because there, I met Jesus. There's this romantic idealist, and he's carried along by the fervor of what Jesus did, who Jesus was. But then comes the moment. This is an amazing story. Then comes the moment where the father pricks that bubble of the romantic idealist. Have you ever had a cause you wanted to die for? Ever? But there's a reason you live for for beyond yourself. That was Peter. He said, where you go, I go. If they crucify you, I get crucified with you. I am a romantic idealist. This costs me everything. And God looks at this fleshly driven, abandoned idealism, and he decides to poke it. And he does. And a little Naomi, a little servant girl says, hey, you're a Galilean. No, I'm blankety, blankety not. He cussed her out. He gave her the middle finger. Who do you think I am? Me? I don't know the dude. The real ordinary businessman who gets overwhelmingly captivated by Jesus and then is struck by his own humanity. He implodes. And he suddenly realizes, this is me. This is me, Chris. This is who I am. I fell in love wildly with Jesus. I said no to sex. I said no to drugs. I said yes to Jesus. Everything. Prayer meeting, I'm there. Gatherings, I'm there. Worship, I'm there. Tithing, I'm there. And suddenly God comes and he pokes you. And there's a, (gasps) as your humanity implodes you. And then as we spoke of last time, there's that great moment on the beach where Jesus sidles up to Peter. He's on the edge of the crowd. The rest of the disciples are sitting there munching away their fish barbecue. Peter's embarrassed. He's awkward. He hasn't seen Jesus since the cross. This a man called Simon van Serena, Simon of Cyrene, who had his name, did what he should have been. He was dragging Jesus' cross up the hill, the very thing that Simon Peter was supposed to be, the great one who said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, was hiding away in the shadows as a little girl intimidated him, and he was a broken man, imploded by his own humanity, and he said, what good can I do to you? But we have a new normal. And Jesus sidles over onto the beach towel and sits next to him, both of them looking over the ocean in different directions, waiting for the rebuke which never came, waiting for the correction that never came, because our Jesus is full of grace. Peter, do you love me? I think as Jesus said, Peter, I think Peter was about to say, I didn't mean it, I'm so sorry, it shouldn't have happened, I know it shouldn't have happened, but Peter, do you love me? He's like, ah! What? Do you love me? It's a magnificent moment of atonement restoration. And we think, well, that's it. That's it. Ordinary guy becomes an idealist, implodes humanly. He gets restored. Story of, no, it isn't. Because Peter was here. Peter was here. He needed the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You see, friends, a partnership with the Holy Spirit is not a scary thing. I don't need to lean up against you and hold your face in my hands and say it's going to be okay. He is trustworthy. What God has in store for you is not humanly possible. Because when He pokes you and that humanity inside of you implodes, it's no surprise to Him. But He wants to create a new normal in you. I want to tell you a few stories which hopefully will help. When I said, yes, I want the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I started speaking in tongues. It's not strange in my country because this is my second language. It's also not strange in South Africa, although I've lived here for 18 years, because there are 11 official languages. Zulu and Sutu, Kosa, Shanghai, English and Afrikaans and so on. So an ear tuned to many languages, another language is not a strange thing. It's been a very busy time for me. Meryl and I will be taking on the leadership of a little church plant in Pasadena, as John Mark said. We're busy with that. Next Sunday is our kind of official boom, boom, boom marriage. Getting married. I'm getting married in the morning. Meryl's going back to college. She's just come back from Australia. My boy, I'm also involved with, we'll be traveling to Dubai. I'm busy putting that together as we train church planters in the Middle East, etc., etc. 
So my mind's busy. My emotions are going in a million directions. Friday morning, I go for a walk for you. And I start praying. And as I start praying, it's like, have all the bills been paid? Have I taken care of it? I've got to book my car in front. You know what it's like? I say, oh, God, thank you that you've given me the gift of tongues. Because English and Afrikaans, they ain't cutting it right now. And I just start speaking in the language he's given me. It quietens my mind. Softens my heart. Why? Because I have a new normal. I need a new language for the new normal. If he's expecting this, this, this raw, nakedly human man to be partnering in some pretty exciting global gospel adventures, it can't be in my language nor in my ability. It's not scary. It's God's gift to bypass a mind that gets so cluttered and so busy. Pray for my family. God, I'm bringing Meryl to you. Mine is chung, 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 chung. Okay, I'll start praying in tongues. Because the Bible says, when I don't know how to pray, the Holy Spirit prays on my behalf. Utterances. Why? Because a new normal needs a new language. It's not weird. It's not crazy. It's refreshing. I was sitting on the plane this morning flying up here. My Bible opened. This is my older Bible because... And then lots of scribbles and the businessman next to me was kind of looking at my Bible and looking at me. And I had a business book I was also reading. And I, th I think he thought, who was this nutter next to me? So I, I, I thought I probably better not pray in tongues right now. That probably won't go down well. Probably not the right thing to do. But, but what I want to draw us into today is, is in a new normal, God gives us a new language. And he also secondly puts us on some new assignments. I don't know about you, but I love healing. Desperate for it. More of it. More of it. I just had a fly to South Africa. I got a call from my brother to say, hey, but I think you need to come. My dad was an alcoholic, and he smoked from the age of 12. God healed him. I'll talk about that in a moment. But the alcohol and smoke, amazing enough, affected his arteries in his left leg. And the doctor, they tried a stent, didn't work. They tried to replace it with an artificial artery, it didn't work. And so the doctor basically said to my dad and my brother, uh, you've got 12 hours for, 24 hours for a miracle or I take the leg. My brother calls me, he says, I think you need to come. My dad's 81. So I get in a plane as soon as I can, fly there. By the time I get there, the leg's gone. And um, I arrive at the hospital. My brother picks me up, takes me to the hospital. We walk in and my, dad, my brother says to my dad, hey, Pops, you can't argue anymore. You haven't got a leg to stand on. I know, it's just the way my family heal, deals with things, you know. If there's an elephant in the room, poke it. I mean, you might as well, make it, you might as well be aware of it. Now, I'm saying all of that because I want to complement it with the fact that the day my father came to faith, he had his third pancreas attack and the doctor said to him, if you have another pancreas attack, you will die. And two o'clock the night when his third pancreas attack came on because of another bout of excessive drinking, he fell on his face and he said, Jesus, if you will heal me, I will serve you for the rest of my days. And he has. Now the amazing thing is this, folks, that the doctor did an x-ray after my dad's conversion and he compared it to an x-ray of my dad before his conversion. And he said, These cannot, this cannot be the same liver. This is the liver of a 20-something-year-old. This is the liver of a man dying See, I believe in healing. And I believe that God wants to put us in a story whereby we can become catalysts of healing. Chris, will God heal everyone? No, He doesn't. I wish He does. And I think as we go from the toddler early church to the, I'm pushing real hard. As we go from the baby infant church to that old timer with the diaper, I'm pushing real hard. We are going to become more and more like the early church. We're going to find ourselves more and more in situations where God does the supernatural in the most amazing ways. I have seen it with my own eyes. I've seen legs grow before my eyes as recently as a few months ago. I've seen medically God heal people of cancer. My friend Rob, who now leads a church in Hong Kong, was called in to pray for a man who was on his deathbed, the doctor said, call the family and he will be gone within hours. So they called Rob in, 
Rob's an ex-Hari Krishna. He's got a great spiritual sensitivity. God saved him from the, um, the movement and, and put him in a great, great Jesus story. And Rob said he arrived there and there was just death in the room. Everyone was downcast, tears, the man, <gasps> you know the story. So Rob sits there for an hour and he opens the Bible and he reads one healing passage after the other to the family. And he says to them, do you believe Jesus can heal today? Yes, we believe. Another passage, another passage, another passage. Eventually he led to the man who he'd never met before and whispered in the man's ear. He said, sir, we've never met. But do you believe Jesus can heal you today? Yes. The man nodded. And he said, sir, do you mind if I pray for you? Yes, the man nodded. And Rod put his hand on the man's face and started praying. And the more he prayed, the more color returned. And by the time Rob left, an hour later, the man was sitting on his bed peeling an orange. And he went home and was still alive at last count. God has put us in a new normal. And he is giving us new assignments. And healing is one of those exquisite assignments. An area Merrill and I love praying for is ladies who can't become pregnant. I don't know why. The, the word in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, 12 is the gifts, plural, of healing, singular. It seems to imply that there are many gifts, charismata, for healing. And I've seen different people, God used different people in different ways. For some reason, Marilyn and I pray, but it started a few years ago at a conference of about 5,000 leaders in South Africa, and I was on the stage when it happened. I felt like God say that He wanted to fill barren wombs as a prophetic statement of what he would do with the church. So I got up to the microphone. I said, I told them what I felt God say. How many of you are not able to have children? A number of hands went up across the auditorium. We prayed nine months later. I got pictures sent to me in the mail of this is the baby that you prayed for. This is the baby you prayed for. There are people on the is it east side, west side, the Beaverton, who when we were here previously, the same thing happened. I don't know why. I don't know, maybe I'm a dad, I've got like a special anointing. <laughs> Should be added to the superheroes, eh? Got stretchy or whatever. <laughs> now, I want to say this for a few reasons, and I'm going to tell you a few more stories, and we're done. How are we doing time-wise? Okay. I believe here tonight, and I'm telling these stories as opposed to other stories, stories of prophecy and things, because I believe that some of you have operated in these gifts before but have grown weary and discouraged. And I want to say to you tonight with all the love that I can muster, please don't. There is a bubble happening. I, I texted a friend of mine, I didn't bring my phone up, in Dubai, Mike Altringham leads a movement of churches and church plants. I'll be with him in a month's time, three weeks' time. And I said, Mike, Give me some current stories. He said, we had a team in Lusaka, Zambia. They were doing an evangelistic event. It was open air, as it often happens in Africa, and there was a cripple at the bus stop, not even in the meeting, but could hear the sound. As the sound of the worship and the preaching reached him, God healed him right then and there. God saved him, and he went back to the meeting to say, I don't know what's happened to me. I was a cripple. I am healthy and whole. He said there was a woman in their church in Dubai who had cancer on the ribs and the doctors went in and took out the wrong rib, stitched her up, the cancer reappeared. They prayed, they got together and said, God, would you heal her? God healed her and they've got the medical evidence of cancer before and nothing after. He said they were sitting in a restaurant the other day and a man had a heart attack and his vitals went, which means he had no sign of life as he lay there on the, on, the, on, the, on the restaurant table. Mike got up from his table, said to the woman he was with, do you mind, I would like to pray for your husband. That takes an enormous amount of courage to do. And she looked at him, tears, you know, one, one can only imagine the story, and he started praying. He said, it took two minutes, Chris. But two minutes later, the man sat up. Was it a raising from the dead? I don't know. Was it a healing? At least it was that. What is my point? We have a new normal, and God has empowered us to live a supernatural life. Quick, others, two other quick stories, and I think that will be enough for tonight. God uses ordinary people. I think the time before that I was here, I told you the story from the Doha church of this young Filipino girl who arrived to work as a maid in one of the palaces true story of a girl in the church. She was a good worker, 
passionate Jesus lover, and slowly but surely she moved up the rung until she became the one who oversaw all the other workers in the palace, and the sheik found out that there was thievery, that people were stealing from him. So he came to her and he said, I want you to find out who is it stealing from me. She had a, an intuition as to who it was, but wasn't 100% certain. So under pressure from the sheik, she fired this other servant. The day this other servant made was leaving, the staff were all there. The sheik was trying to make a point. He was standing there from his upstairs office as she walked out. This Filipino gal, believer, Jesus lover, believing that we have a new normal, said, I need to know, did I fire the right woman? And she felt the Spirit of God say to her, look in her shoes. She asked the girl to stop. She said, would you mind getting out of your shoes? The reply was aggressive and defensive, but she was patiently persistent. And she stepped out of her shoes, the woman did, and there in the shoes were the jewels. The sheik called her upstairs to his office and he said, excuse me, you want to tell me what happened there? Now she's got a problem. This is a Muslim man. Although they allow evangelism amongst non-emirates, Christianity is not applauded. But she decided to take a stand. She said, sir, I don't know if you'll understand, but I believe in a triune God, a Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I believe the Holy Spirit is alive. I believe the Holy Spirit speaks to me. She tells him the story of feeling it's the woman and then knowing it's the woman. This man looks at her and he says, I'm not sure I believe in a God who is three because I just believe there's one God. But if your God who is three can speak to you about a woman who's stealing from me, then I want to ask you two things. Number one, I want you to tell my kids about this. And number two, every time I do a business deal, I want to call you in and I want you to tell me if your God says that's a good deal. <laughs> Why does the Holy Spirit matter? Because God's put us in a new normal. Why am I still wonderfully married? I was telling the congregation in the first session, I love my wife. She's just been away for two weeks, and unapologetically, what I look forward to most is not even our first night of lovemaking, but it's that first time I embrace her, and I put my nose and snuggle up to her, and I smell Meryl. I don't know how to describe it to you. She's a mystery to me. I don't get her. I said to her, please don't ever let me get you, because I might get bored, but right now, I don't get you. See, what does it take to husband a woman who God has given to you? It's a new normal. It's not a negotiated contract, you do, she does, he does, we do. No, it's this incredible privilege of serving and loving and caring, spirit empowered to a new normal. I want to close. But while I was praying for you, I felt like God gave me four things. The first is this. I think that some of you on the Peter trajectory ordinary guy, business guy, who becomes a rampant, radical, romantic idealist, and then poof, human implosion. I feel like some of you were there. You are now living with the rack of the pain and the disappointment. You were so radical. You told your family they're going to hell. They don't believe what you believe. They're going to hell now. Today, they're going to go to hell. And now suddenly, you're smoking dope with them. You're sleeping around. You think, what happened? What happened? There's a restoration, and there's an empowerment. That's what happened. Secondly, I do think some of you are a little bit fearful because we love control, don't we? I want to control my life. When, where, how, I do. And the thing with the Holy Spirit journey is it's surrender. It's yours. And I think God wants to remove some fear and anxiety. Thirdly, the gifts of healing. I think some of you want to find greater confidence to do it. Many stories, I've told a few, many, many, many stories. And fourthly, I do think some of you have never tangibly felt the Holy Spirit. Folks, He is. He's tangible. I prayed for a young gal. I don't know how old she was. She came to me at the end of the five o'clock and she said, Chris, I can't become pregnant. And I could see, I looked for the ring on her finger. She's married, but there wasn't a ring. I thought, mm, marital tension because of this. Okay. I said, put, you, put your hands on your tummy because that's too tender a place to touch. 
I put my hand on it. And as I st- could feel literally there's this control. I'm in control. I'm in control. And then more and more, it's just this. As the Spirit of God came upon her, she wept and wept and wept. As I was going upstairs to have a quick bite to eat, a girl bumps into me. She says to me, I knew I was going to see you tonight. Okay, is that weird or is that fine? Is that okay? What's happening? She tells me, I start praying for her. And the presence of God comes. Why? Because he's a person. He's tangible. We can know it with him. Andrew Murray, the great Scottish missionary in Africa, stumbled one day walking in one of the dusty African towns, and a man reached to grab him, and he said, no, 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 it's okay, I'm fine. For a moment, I missed his presence, and I stumbled. Some of you have never experienced this wonderful Holy Spirit. Let's pray together.